Hey guys, what's going on? This is Dice Squad. I am Marshall Dice, known as Adam Campbell, and I am live here this morning at Origins Game Fair 2017, and I am here at another booth with... Sandy Peterson. Sandy Peterson, and you are? I am a long-term game designer. First published game was Call of Cthulhu back in 1981. I am now the uh, uh, chief officer of Peterson Games, a tiny little game company out of uh, Texas, which is most famous for Cthulhu Wars. Awesome. So going way back, have you always been a fan of board and card games? Yes. I used to stay in from recess in grade school to play Clue with my buddies. <laughs> what was your favorite uh, character? Colonel Mustard. Did you always win? No. <laughs> Though I do remember several times having to accuse myself as the murderer, <laughs> which is one of the fun things about Clue. <laughs> hey, I did it, dudes. <laughs> like... So how did you get your start in game design? Well, <clears throat> um, as a kid, if you want to go way back, eight years old, my dad got a copy of the Gettysburg Avalon Hill war game without a set of rules. Don't ask me how. And I, I break this thing open and look at the pieces and compare them and I am and like, there's something here that's really interesting. And then when I got older, I actually managed to get my hand on some board games. started playing with my friends, started making my own modifications. I wanted other battles besides Gettysburg. I wanted to do World War One and stuff. And so I kept, so always growing up in high school, I was doing game stuff. And then uh, in college, to get a job to support me and my family while I was in school, I essentially became a part-time designer for Chaosium, which is where I did college. And then from that, I dropped out of college, my application became my vocation, and the only full-time job I've had as an adult has been game designer, which is kind of a, a weird lifestyle, but I don't have anything to compare it to, to know how weird it is. Now, I, I've also heard that you've also worked on a few uh, computer games. Yes, I spent 22 years doing computer games. Worked on Doom, Quake, uh, the original Civilization computer game, uh, the Age of Empires series, Halo Wars. I actually taught video game design for a couple years at the graduate level at a college in uh, Alice. So, but, then I went, but then I went back into board games. So role-playing games, computer games, and back to board games. Here I am, full circle. So what were some of your favorites in the world of video and computer games that you worked on? Besides, what, what, if you could like point on, or yeah, what, what, if you could pick one of them. Wow, I'm probably most proud of Age of Empires 3. Okay. I think I did a bang up job on that. So did you have a hand in those those cheat codes that everyone always would play with, like getting the cars, getting the flying so dogs? Here's how it works. There's three different guys that work on a video game, three different kinds of guys. There's, there's the programmers who insert cheat codes because they're being nagged to do it by the artists. Because the programmers have all these bugs to fix at the end of the game, and all the cheat codes go in at the very end. There's the artists who love cheat codes because they have nothing to do at the end of the game project, and they're making up new creatures to put in the cheat codes. And then there's the designers who have cheat codes early in the project so they can cheat to do testing, and then they hate having the cheat codes go out to the public. That was what I was. <laughs> but they go out to the public anyway because because they get loved in. We well, have yeah, well, I. I Playing Age of Empires, I didn't have any idea until my cousin came over and was like, "Oh man, you get the, you can get this car in the game." And he typed in this cheat code, and a car appeared. And I'm like, "Whoa, this is really cool!" And it completely destroys all of the game strategy. <laughs> <laughs> all those subtle relations that went through the game, the fact that long women cost wood instead of gold, all these things, all gone because you got those damn cars. <laughs> You want to play Age of Empires? No. Why? Because you cheat. Because you just use the cars. <coughs> well, I think when you play in head-to-head, uh, -head, the cheat codes are usually turned off. But <laughs> Not for me and my cousin. Okay, well, there you go then. All right, well, fast forward now. So you have Cthulhu Wars. Yes. What was the inspiration behind this game? Well, uh, I'll tell you the truth. I was on the verge of retiring from game design forever and going off and taking, or at least my own company, and going off and taking a job literally in India as kind of the fun budsman for a small Indian game company. Okay? They were going to give me an excellent salary, it's going to be there for a year, get a share of the company. It was cherry, right? And I said, well, before I go, I'm going to set up an income stream and do 
one last dream game, like a swan song. And so it's got to be Cthulhu because I love Cthulhu. It's going to be totally over the top with all these giant great figures and, and really intense gameplay and, and asymmetry, everything I love about the game. And so your, your, your final fantasy. My final fantasy, my ultimate Sandy Peterson game, and then I was done doing my own game, so I had to go work for the man. And the man, he, he was good to me, right? So, and so I did Cthulhu Wars and did a Kickstarter for it, hoping it would get like a quarter million, maybe, in, in Wild Dreams. And then it was a quarter million like the first day. Okay, so I called the guys in India and said, guys, I gotta stay here and this Kickstarter's going nuts. And they said, oh no, come work for us. I said, sorry. I guess they here, and then it did 1.4 million dollars, and uh, established. And so instead of being my swan song, it became like a phoenix and rekindled me. I founded the whole game company from it. Now I got other games coming out, and it became this like phenomenon where I got 20 uh, uh, or, or more, more than 20 expansions, and all these fans. And I cannot keep the sucker in print, right? We have to keep uh, it. So that is where that came from. My swan song, my ultimate game, and that's one of the reasons why it's so wacky and weird and personal, because that's what it was going to be. So what's the premise of Cthulhu Wars? The premise of Cthulhu Wars, every other uh, Lovecraft game, starting with Call of Cthulhu, which is my fault, is heroic investigators against the mythos. Okay? Nothing wrong with that theme. But I wanted to see Cthulhu... You, those games always end before Cthulhu comes out of the deeps and destroys the world. Because if either you stop him before he comes out, or he comes out and you lost, right? At the end of Arkham Horror or whatever. So I wanted to have a game where Cthulhu is coming out and he's got armies of, of dog monsters, and there's mountains of protoplasm, and there's telepathy blanketing the world with his nightmaric visions and all this stuff. Well, the only way to have that in a game. Raining cats and dogs, mass hysteria, right? Hysteria. Uh, 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 and so. The only way to do that is to have some other things as badass as Cthulhu, and that's what the game is. Everyone is a great old one or an outer god or some awful thing from beyond space and time. You're invading Earth, you're battling over, Earth is being blanketed by your magics and your curses and your stuff, and then the game's very entropic. Doom points never go down, gates never go away, desecration markers never leave. The game just, the world gets worse and worse and worse until it, there's a climax and someone wins. And hopefully it's me. Well, hopefully. So, the base game contains what? The base game contains four factions. It has 64 of these 28 millimeter scale figures. I say scale, they aren't 28 millimeters tall. You can see they're things like eight inches high, right? And, uh, and uh, tons of cardboard uh, with thick stock. In fact, I'm going to walk over here. Sure. If you're a game player, check that out. See what I mean? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, that's, that's not okay, bad. This is, like this is a luxury game. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's big enough. It's like a cookie, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you've played enough games to know what I'm talking about. So the game has all this stuff and everything you need to play. And the game is, like I said, a luxury product. The retail price is $1.99, okay? Which is like, wow, that's a lot for a game. I don't think every game should be that expensive, but I think it's okay for gamers to have one or two special games on their shelf. And the fact is, if you were to walk around here at the convention and look for 64 awesome figures like this for 200 bucks, you could not do it. No, not at all. So even if you just want the figures, it's great. But inside it, there's a fabulous game. It's really fast playing. It looks like one of those games that takes like eight hours to play. It is legitimately about an hour and a half, two hours. And then you're done. When you finish just before you've had a chance to, to really do all of your strategies, you kind of want to go back and play it again. This time I'm going to do Broth first, or I'm going to try the, the third eye spell first. You know, and that's kind of how it works. And then I also see that you have all, multiple expansions to this game to make it even bigger. And it keeps getting bigger. You can go up to eight players. You get extra independent great old ones. You've got these extra monsters you can, that people can hire. You have maps. You know, the maps, unlike some games, when you get a map expansion, it adds to the map, and then you have a tabletop that has to be the size of, of your garage. But these maps replace the existing map so you have somewhere new to play. So they don't actually expand, extend the game length. It's just like, everything's different because now there's glaciers, or now we're on Pluto, or now we're in a giant library and people have to check out books, and if it makes too much noise, the librarian comes and crashes down on them, right? I mean, seriously, this is the things we have, so. And the librarian walks up and goes to Cthulhu, I'm sorry, you can't check any more books because you're late fines, and Cthulhu goes, no! That's exactly how it works, right, so. <laughs> so, are you going to be going to Gen Con? Yes. 
Yeah, is there anything big coming up for Gen Con? I know we got a lot here at Origins. Anything big for Gen Con? Uh, yes, we are going to have a lot more Kuma War stuff, which is always a delight. And we may have uh, some Pathfinder stuff. So Cthulhu is now, instead of going to Pluto, he's now venturing into the realm of Pathfinder. Yeah, being glory. We actually have a, um, a book coming out, uh, Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos for Pathfinder. So that unwieldy title, it's been kickstarted, got $200,000, and it's going to be delivering at some point. And then it's, it's basically my take on Cthulhu Mythos once again for role playing. But instead of Call of Cthulhu, it's in a fantasy setting, so you can so your, your dungeon players can open up a door in the deep dungeon and there's Cthulhu. Awesome. Probably they will not win based on the stats they gave. <laughs> of course, because you know the dungeon master wants to screw over all their, the players. Well, you know. <clears throat> so Sometimes you just have to keep them in line. <laughs> Very true. So anything coming down the pike, aside from oh, Gen Con, oh, any oh, big yeah, thing? Sure. So here's what we got. In this fall, we're doing Evil High Priest, which is a... Uh, a worker placement game where you play cultists of, say, Cthulhu. And everyone wants to be the high priest. And so you're so you're all in the same cult. You're squabbling over who's going to release. You have a big uh, a, a cult map of Cthulhu where you're taking off the elder signs as you go along. And when all, when they're all off, Cthulhu wakes up. And whoever did the most work to release him, he points to the high priest, and that guy wins. But the thing, the kind of the, the cool thing about this worker placement game is that there's different cult maps. So instead of Cthulhu, you could play in the Black Goat map, or the Yellow Sign map, or the Opener of the Way map, and every map has different rules and different things and different stuff you're doing. Like the Cthulhu map has the Cult Shoggoth that only one guy can control at a time, and it has a Deep One track where the Deep Ones give you rewards, but nothing else has that. So every time you play this worker placement game, there's a different, like, like a whole different map you're playing on, which is, which is unusual, as you know, for a worker placement game. After that, this, this fall, we're doing a game called Planet Apocalypse, which is a co-op game, which is kind of a cross between Fury Road and Doom. Heroic guys living on the on the road, taking on demons from hell. So, Sounds badass. It's, it's fairly badass. There's a few images of it up online. The demons are really weird and cultic looking. Um, they're being done by Keith Thompson, a, uh, a well-known artist. He actually, he actually did the... Uh, he did works mostly in movies. He did the monsters for Pacific Rim. Really? Yeah, which my quick review is that the monsters are the only part of Pacific Rim I like, right? <laughs> I like the robots. I was I thought it was a, a tragic waste of Idris Elba. <laughs> wow. But, right. But the monsters were cool, that's what he did. So he's doing our demons. And so we're gonna have monsters, they don't look like Cthulhu Wars figures, but they're as detailed, but they're fabulous and weird and quirky like that. Uh, then in the uh, uh, in the spring of next year. We have a game out coming, coming Hyperspace, which is Sandy Peterson's 4X Space Game. And I brought a, uh, oh. a prototype of it with me. Woo! There it is. All prototypey with things made out of foam plastic and, you know. <laughs> lock, lock, tight up, handcuffed so we, to you. So we have, uh, we are moving ahead with, with stuff. Very cool. So where can people find all of your products? PetersonGames.com And remember, Peterson is spelled without an O. All E's. See? And we'll have a link below for you to check that out. But it's really fascinating, a Final Fantasy that's grown into such a large game and future games for the future. Well, I mean, it's a... It's a huge, Say that three times we a, fast. We have a huge footprint as a game company. Our game, our game company is pathetically tiny. It's only six employees. And all this stuff with this first, with this like high-end production is like six people working, in, working literally out of my house. <laughs> so it's like, it's it's kind of a an unusual story, I think. But uh, <laughs> you, should hear the, you should hear the Dice Squad story sometime. Oh, I, 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 a lot of us are living on the edge, right? Abs well, of course, because we're here at Origins, living on the edge! <sighs> ah, but anyway, so once again, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. But from all of us here at Dice Squad, continuing our coverage of Origins Game Fair 2017, this is Marshall Dice, also known as Adam Campbell, with... Andy Peterson of Peterson Games. And we'll see you guys later.